Distinguished guests, welcome to the third panel of today, which is entitled Investment Climate in Turkey and Future of Investment Management. Now I would like to invite our moderator and the panelists to take their seats. Our moderator for this session is Dr. Hakan Avdan, Executive Board Member of International Cooperation Platform. And the panelists are Tim Ash, Senior Strategist, Blue Bay Asset Management, UK. Dr. Mark Mobius, founding partner, Mobius Capital Partners, LLP, USA. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, all, uh, dear distinguished guests. I would like to thank you all for coming and joining us uh, for this panel. Uh, as my colleague said, we have very important uh, guests today, uh, two important guests. Uh, Mark Mobius and Tim Ash, uh, both are very well known in Turkey, especially in the financial world, yet uh, both know Turkey very well and they've been covering Turkey and investing in Turkey for a very long time. On, on the other hand, it won't be uh, wrong to say uh, they've been advocate of Turkey uh, in the in international arena during this time. So uh, I'd like to mention that uh, we will have a kind of different format today uh, and I will have separate discussions with my guests, first starting with Tim, uh, in order to keep focus intact on, the, on our guests. So I will uh, first start Tim. Tim, welcome. I'm joining you. Okay, I think you hear me. Uh, Tim, uh, welcome again. So uh, we've been, you know, you for a long time. You know, you, you are well known in Turkey. Uh, let me tell you about Tim. Uh, many people know Tim. Uh, he is a very wide, a good <laughs> press coverage in Turkey as well, time to time. But uh, let me uh, tell his uh, bio, sh short bio, uh, briefly. Uh, Tim is a senior strategist at Blue Bay Asset Management since 2017. Before then. Uh, he's been uh, working in uh, different banks uh, for the last 20 years, from, ranging from ABN AMRO, Nomura, Bear Stearns. He's a blogger on Turkey and emerging, emerging Europe, advised various uh, Western governments on Turkey and Ukraine policy. He first visited Turkey in 1987. Uh, he is a regular visitor and writer about Turkey since. And uh, he's uh, using Twitter very actively, right? <laughs> Uh, we are following him on, on, he's in, on his tweets as well. Uh, today our panel is uh, heading is about investment climate in Turkey and future of investment management. Uh, I'll start with Turkey, so your expertise a bit. Uh, but uh, we know Tim, and uh, sometimes, Tim, you take a hit in, in Turkey when you become critical <laughs> sometimes, right, on economic policy making. But uh, we know that uh, you are saying things, uh, what you believe is right and what is uh, right for Turkey. Uh, on the other hand, we always know that uh, you supported Turkey's cause uh, against credit rating agencies, historically, because uh, they've been critical and wh while they were downgrading Turkey's rating, and Tim always criticized them uh, for not being fair to Turkey. So he loves Turkey, right? It's not wrong. <laughs> And uh, he's a good, good friend, good friend of mine also. Uh, since we'll have two separate uh, discussions, I will start right to start uh, questions. Then uh, after my questions, I'll try to uh, use time e e efficiently. Then I will get some uh, questions from you, uh, from your uh, audience. Uh, let me start with Turkey, as I said. Uh, historically, uh, Turkey has some problems. Uh, we had good times and bad times as we had an emerging market, uh, economic problems, uh, financial problems. We ran through some uh, financial and the currency crisis last year. Uh, how do you see the Turkey's uh, current investment climate nowadays? And uh, how foreign uh, investors perceive Turkey? Um, thank you, Hakan, and thanks for the organizers for inviting me uh, to come to Istanbul. Great city, great country, uh, and it's been a very interesting conference. And I hope it will be. Um, I always find on Turkey, especially if you Twitter, I mean, uh, I must be doing something right because half the time I'm hated by pro-AKP guys and the other half the time I'm hated by uh, 
anti-AKP guys and secular guys. I, I try and be balanced and keep it in the middle. Uh, and it's a bit of a battleground in Twitter sphere, uh, so I get a kicking quite often. Uh, but anyway, um, in terms of the Turkey story, um, I mean, it's a challenge. It's certainly a challenging story, I guess, from an investment perspective. Po uh, Blue Bay were a big portfolio, uh, sorry, uh, fixed income institutional investor. We manage about 65 billion. About half is emerging markets. Uh, and we've been significant investors in Turkey over the last uh, 20 years, I guess. And also, you know, we are still invested in Turkey. Uh, we've always liked the story. We like Turkish banks. We like Turkish corporates. Uh, the, the micro sector typically is, you know, you, you meet some of the best bankers and best uh, real industry managers there are out there. Uh, but this year has been incredibly challenging, I think, for guys like us. And I guess, you know, uh, our faith in the Turkey story has been questioned. I think that's, that's a fair comment to make. Um, I was here a couple of weeks ago in my usual kind of uh, kicking the tires investor trip. And I, I, I came out with kind of three, you know, having a time frame for the Turkey story, really. And it's like short, medium, and long in terms of how I view Turkey. Uh, and the long-term story, I, I, I, th I think, still is pretty compelling. You know, I, I, you know it's a you know, great demographics, great business environment, great banks, corporates. Uh, whatever you think about the AKP administration, they want to do business. They want to invest. They want to create jobs. You know, they want to do business. And I think, you know, Turkey's a very dynamic place, and I think you know, over the long term, those, those factors will come to the fore. I could also mention, you know, very strong public finance profile, uh, strong willingness to pay. I don't think that's historically been uh, reflected in the country's rating. So, and, and I, one sort of political comment. Um, I guess, you know, many people sitting outside the country in the last few years have questioned Turkey's geopolitical orientation and its demographic, demogra sorry, uh, de uh, democratic uh, uh, advance <laughs> where it was going. Um, I think actually developments over the last year have made me encouraged from a long-term perspective. You, if you look at the Istanbul elections, whichever, whatever your political orientation, in a way the Istanbul elections reaffirmed Turkey's democratic credentials. You had elections, you had two elections, uh, and you had a result. And I think it was, it was healthy for the country uh, that uh, someone else won an election in Turkey. And I think that's, that's a positive thing and the election was accepted. And I think the other factor now, if you think of within AKP, well, within and without, that you now have forces within AKP and you know, moving outside the party, think of Babajan, Davatoglu, you know, there are now, in a way, checks and balances around AKP, around the AKP kind of electorate. And again, that is healthy, I think, from a longer term. So I, my sense is Turk, Turks have, you know, looked over the abyss, a, a abyss of, of uh, a different style of governments, a centralized government, and uh, unfortunately a more authoritarian government. I use that word uh, uh, somewhat reluctantly, but, you know, you have to kind of use it. And I think they want something different, right? And I think over the longer term, the next political iteration in Turkey will be, you know, more liberal, more democratic, uh, perhaps you know, a, a move back Western. I know there's a lot of focus at the moment on, you know, Turkey's move away from the West, but, but I really think that over the longer term, the strong macroeconomic kind of underpinnings of this country, and I think in the end, Turkey's democratic uh, credentials, I guess, will, will come to the fore. And that, that makes me positive over the longer term, short and medium term. In the short term, clearly we had a, a huge macro, macro and policy shock last year. You know, huge currency devaluation, uh, you know, massive adjustments. Uh, and we've seen, you know, a remarkable recovery. You know, there is talk of this V-shaped recovery. I don't really buy that. There is a recovery. I don't think it's going to be V-shaped because of the balance sheet problems in banks, etc. But no doubt, we, we were all surprised at how shallow the recession was and the fact that there is recovery is a positive. And I think the way the policy, the current policy elite have managed macro policy, this very micro-management of monetary policy and macro, and also the, the micro-management of, for example, food prices and, and markets, you know, it stabilized the lira, it's stabilized markets in the short term, it's provided a basis for some kind of recovery. Um, so I can see, you know, as 
we've seen in the last kind of year, the stability in the markets and something of a recovery. Uh, and that can happen, you know, I can see that surviving for six months, maybe a year. But I'm really concerned maybe in the medium term. This is, you know, I, you know, what, what is really interesting, I mean, you, you talked about the investor, the investor perceptions and, you know, I am, a, you know, I'm not a Turk, I have no Turkish family relatives, I have no angle, I'm, I'm a pure foreigner who sits in London, comes to Turkey as often as I can, meets as many Turks as I, I can, bankers, policy makers, I try and really understand the story. And, you know, I have to hold my hand up and say, as someone who thought they understood Turkey a year ago, I now hold my hand up and say, I don't. I have really low conviction, investment conviction, at the moment around the Turkey story, and essentially because I don't like the money, well, I don't like the macro policy mix. I don't like the, the micromanagement of, of economic policy. I don't like the intervention in markets. I don't like uh, the fact that, you know, to stabilize the exchange rate, the treasury and the central bank killed the offshore swap market. It's made it very difficult for guys like us to invest. You know, we want to buy bonds. We, you know, that's our, what we do. And if you can't hedge your, your bond portfolio through the offshore swap market, you know, it makes it much more difficult to invest. And I think it's, it's telling, it's really telling. One statistic to share with you, you know, Actually, from a fixed income perspective, you've had a fantastic story over the last year. You've had the currency more or less stable. You've seen a 1,000 basis points of spread compression. Imagine that, a 1,000 basis points. So bond prices rallied like crazy in terms of local markets. Now, every other period in Turkish recent history, contemporary history, when I followed the country, when you've had that level of adjustment in terms of the rates market, right, Foreigners have loved the story. They've made a load of money and they've put a lot of money to work in Turkey, right? If, uh, if you think of the, those previous times, 2006, 12, 13, 15, 16, well, you had similar policy mistakes, policy adjustments, bond market rally. In each of those periods, you've usually seen about 20 billion of, around 20 billion of bond inflows, net bond inflows. This time you've had 2 billion of net outflows. So actually the rally you've seen the foreigners have not participated, despite the fact that currency looked really cheap, you had this mass deflation that looked like we should be investing, right? And the reason we haven't invested is because there's no conviction, because, you know, we don't, again, we don't like the monetary policy mix. The question is, sure, there's a deflationary story going on now, disinflation, we like that, currency stable, but what happens if the Fed hikes rates? What happens when this cycle stops? Will the, will the central bank of Turkey hike rates? And the reality is we don't know and they probably won't and we'll probably see a repeat of what we saw in 2018. And it's very hard, to be honest, as a, a fixed income portfolio manager uh, working across 70 odd emerging market countries. You know, you know I, I'll be open and, cr and frank and critical. You know, it's very hard to invest in a country when you know, the basis of monetary policy is, is uber unorthodox policy where the key decision makers think that high interest rates cause inflation. I mean, no one in G20 believes that. So imagine us as portfolio managers, where we've put lots of money to work in Turkey, and Fed hikes rates, the, the global environment changes, maybe we're ending the, the, the, the deflation cycle in Turkey, central bank needs to raise rates, it doesn't raise rates, we have a repeat of 2018. How can we explain to our end investors why, we, why the hell did we invest in a country that has such an orthodox monetary policy that is totally against the world orthodoxy? No one believes this stuff globally. So that's why no one is investing. That's why portfolio, foreign portfolio managers are not putting money to work when they should, when it looks like it's compelling because the, the, the, the, the number one problem in Turkey is monetary policy. Now it's great at the moment. It, central, the new central bank, look, uh, central bank governor looks like a hero you know, delivering massive rate cuts, but what happens when the music stops? And the reality is he's going to have to knock on the door of the presidential palace and ask to raise rates like we had in 2018. So, so, um, so just to summarize things, love Turkey long term. You know, we want to invest in this country. We, we buy the story, right? Uh, short term, I can see you, Turkey managing through the next year, muddling through, 
perhaps surprising a bit on the upside in terms of growth, but unless you, have, you, unless you go back to orthodox monetary policy settings, it is going to end in tears again. And what worries me is if you think of those cycles, those stop-go economic cycles in Turkey, going back 2006, 12, 13, 15, 16, this, and, and then 18, the cycles are getting shorter. Just think about it, five years, three years, two years, maybe one year, right? And, and I guess, uh, you know, in the end, you have an administration that wants growth, wants jobs because of the political cycle. Uh, you know, it needs to really believe in the story that you, you need a period of, of uh, extended adjustment. If, you know, yesterday we heard uh, Minister Albarak talk about getting inflation down to low single digits. It'd be great if you could get 5%, which is the inflation target, and stick there. But how are you going to do that if you're not willing to raise interest rates when you need to? I mean, that's a long-winded answer <laughs> to your question. Apologies. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, you gave a uh, very, um, I mean, uh, broad picture. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, I know you believe in Turkey's story for, for the long term, for the long, uh, in the long, long run. As you said, uh, Turkey has uh, current problems in the short term maybe, but uh, to, as you said, Turkey's uh, main strength uh, has been the corporate sector actually, and the banks. Uh, there is very dynamic corporate sector in Turkey and our ba banks are very healthy in Turkey at least. Uh, that's that's our, uh, one of our most important uh, strengths, I, I think. Uh, Going through the micro, maybe I can ask a uh, similar question. Uh, Turkey has an historically inflation problem. What would, what would be your suggestion, uh, what would be the interest rates policy to accommodate long-term growth while keeping inflation under control? Well, you know, I'd argue the most successful central bank governor in Turkey's history, Dormaz Yilmaz, was the only guy who delivered the inflation target of 5% back in 2011. You know, look, in the end, you know, to the, to in recent history, since 2011, the Turkish Central Bank has tried to reinvent the wheel. I mean, tried to be too clever by far. I mean, in the end, you either believe that, you know, to get sustained, sustainable growth up, and there's no reason why Turkey shouldn't be growing at 5 to 7%, right? It needs go back to default settings, go back to orthodox monetary policy that guys like us believe in, guys like you believe in, you know, it, that, the, the, the number one problem, t Turkey's, you know, it was interesting, if you go back a year or 18 months, everyone was an expert on Turkey. It was a, for guys like me who tried to know Turkey, based in London, everyone was suddenly saying, you know, Turkey was inevitably going to fail, the banking sector's was always bankrupt, uh, there's going to be a sovereign default, banks are going to fail. That was like 18 months ago, right? The consensus in London, if you read Twitter sphere, right? And it's pretty remarkable, you know, a year and a half year later, we've had no bank failures, no runs on banks, no sovereign defaults, the currency adjusted, interest rates were eventually hiked, probably far higher than would have had to be hiked if they were hiked earlier, and you've had an adjustment, right? Uh, the resilience of the Turkish economy and Turks is remarkable and it's testimony to the fact that I think the Turkish banking sector was in a far better shape than everyone from outside imagined back in, in last summer. Um, and, and, you know, the Turkey has ingredients to be a great story, like it was in that period. And to give AKP a huge amount of, of acclaim and credit, I mean, from 2002 to 2011, Turkey was a, an economic miracle, right? It needs to go back to those settings. Don't reinvent the wheel, right? I mean, if you go back to, again, 2002, you had the IMF program, 2003. Uh, the AKP came in and they, they, they kept the economy on autopilot. They didn't try anything too radical. They did a lot of good things like privatization, et cetera, which, and, and de deregulation, which was very positive for the economy. Um, I think it, in the end, you know, Turkey can be really successful. But we need, the, the, the fundamental problem is monetary policy. And that needs changing. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving away from uh, economy a bit. Uh, there's one problematic area looks like uh, in front of us uh, currently. What do you think about uh, Turkey's uh, relations with the West and especially with the US uh, these days? Yeah, 
could be a, a <laughs> potential risk. Well, there. I, I could. I, you could ask me about about the West's relationships with the West, right? You could talk about <laughs> yeah. Europe's relationships with the U.S. Uh, you know, it, it's incredibly difficult to call Trump on anything, right? Uh, you know, if you'd have come three months ago, I mean, what's interesting for me is when I try and understand the Turkey story, I meet with everyone, right? So, I mean, I meet Turks, I meet bankers, economists, I'll meet all the diplomatic people. And if you came three or four months ago, the universal view, I guess in the US diplomatic stroke think tank community was S400s are coming and Turkey's gonna get sanctioned. I mean, everyone you met said the same thing. I mean, I'm sure yeah. we had the same kind of conversations. And it's utterly remarkable that uh, whatever the personal chemistry between Trump and Erdogan, I mean, Erdogan pulled off a, an incredible feat to, to make sure that those S-400s didn't result in sanctions. And no one in Washington can quite believe it, right? Remarkable. I don't know what the basis of this relationship is between Erdogan and, and Trump, um, you know, whatever. Uh, um, but it, the reality is Trump is acting to foil the threat of sanctions uh, from the US uh, establishment. I mean, that's the best way to describe it. Um, but it saddens me in a way because uh, the way I view things is Turkey's natural place is in the West. T Turkey's natural orientation is to the West. Turks, you know, two thirds of trade, investment, financing is from the West. Turks don't go shopping in Moscow. You know, they don't send the kids for education in Moscow. They send the kids for education in Europe, the UK, the US. Uh, you know, Ataturk, I mean, look West. I don't think he looked East particularly. Uh, so the state of Turkey's relationship with the West really, really saddens me. Uh, fault on both sides, absolutely. S we say six of one, half a dozen the other. I don't want to blame Turkey for everything. Uh, I think the West's mismanaged the relationship with the West. Uh, and, you know, for me, I, some of you know, I, I was an ardent supporter of Turkish EU accession. I thought this was really important for Turkey. I thought it was really important for Europe. Uh, but the reality, I guess, is kind of, I would blame Sarkozy and Merkel, the privileged partnership, if you go back to 2010. The reality is there was never a level playing field, right? Racists in continental Europe, to call the spade a spade, didn't really want Turkey in the European Union. And that was reflected in the Sarkozy-Merkel kind of story, right? Uh, and, and I think the Turks got that. I mean, you know, the Turks realized that this wasn't a level playing field. They weren't being treated uh, the same as countries in emerging Europe. I mean, I always raise the case. I mean, imagine Turkey's been a NATO ally for 60 years. Romania and, uh, Romania and Bulgaria were in the Warsaw Pact and they got in and they're, they're, they're poorer than Turkey. So all this talk about economic, lack of economic development in Turkey is the main barrier to EU accession, complete kind of bull. Uh, but um, the, the reality, I guess, now is both sides have moved in different directions, right? And, and I think it's clear Macron's comments a month or so ago, the whole EU accession, EU enlargement gig is over. It's over for Turkey, it's over for Albania, it's over for Macedonia. I mean, whatever I think about, it's great to have Turkey in the EU. The reality is the, the political and popular mood in Europe is against foreigners, a horrible, terrible thing to imagine, but that's the reality. Uh, and, and, you know, unfortunately, it would be against, massive against Turkish EU accession. Again, it would be against Ukraine, it would be against Albania. They don't want, I mean, the popular mood in Europe is against enlargement. So, so I think the challenge for Turkey and the European Union now is to, th and actually not just Turkey, it's about EU, the, the near neighborhood policies. What is the relationship going to be between the European Union and those countries around its periphery, including the UK, right? Who I assume, unfortunately, also is going to exit the European Union uh, imminently. Uh, and I guess the, it, what's interesting is the, the strength of the UK-Turkish relationship at the moment, I think, is based on the fact that the Brits realize that whatever deal, or the Turks also realize, whatever deal the Brits get is probably going to be uh, a, a framework for what countries like Turkey will likely get. So I think that the challenge for Turkey will be to, to um, it, as I said, it, it naturally orientates towards the West. It, it's always going to be anchored into Europe, 
but we all need to think about this new relationship. What is this new relationship between the EU and Turkey? I think it will be something similar to what the UK gets when we leave. Uh, and then the US-Turkish relationship. Um, you know, I, I, you know the, you can, I guess you can raise massive questions now about the future of NATO because of Trump. Uh, I still feel there's a big risk that sanctions will come on around S400s. Um, we can debate, you know, Turkey's right on or whatever within NATO to buy S400s, but you know, it was interesting. I thought this morning with the announcement that Trump signed the Hong Kong sanctions bill, that despite trying to resist that, uh, it shows how weak he is in DC. Clearly, in DC, there is a a weight of momentum against Turkey. Unfortunately, Turkey has not played the the Washington story very well, aside from Erdogan and Trump, um, there is definitely a lot of momentum in DC to sanction Turkey around S-400s. Uh, Trump's problems with impeachment may, may, may make it difficult to stop that process. And there's also the Halk Bank thing that is outstanding. Uh, I, I, unfortunately, I'm being honest with you guys, I don't think the Turkish authorities have managed that process very well. Uh, not participating in the court hearing means Turkey is likely to get a contempt of court fine, which is likely to be very significant. That looks, the direction of travel there is pretty negative. I've spoken okay. a long time, so I'll, <laughs> I'll, st I'll stop there probably. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, th th thank you. Uh, uh, let's move on to global uh, issues a, a bit, actually. When you say Trump, we, we know that we have a different kind of uh, president in the United States. Uh, what do you think about uh, his uh, trade wars? And uh, now he's uh, started talking about negative interest rates for U.S. as well. Uh, do you think that could be a threat for the world economy? Well, very briefly, trade war and maybe negative interest rates for the U.S. Not which well, I'm sure Mark's going to have some, some answers to yeah. that one. He's a U.S. guy. He's probably got better acquainted with him. I, I, I just, it's just incredible, right? I mean, from a, a, as a Brit, you know, I mean, unfortunately, this is the mood of the day, right? I mean... As I said, I, I spoke about racism in Europe and, and populism. You know, it, it, it is popular stuff, you know, uh, kicking foreigners. Unfortunately, that, that seems to, you know, play with a certain part of the electorate. Um, but, I mean, I mean we, you, I'm sure you're going to ask about, about Brexit, but what I find extraordinary is, uh, you know, Brexit-style voters, Trump-style voters, uh, like this anti-globalization stuff, right? I mean, they think that uh, they think they're somehow going to be better off. You know, I mean, they, they may not have been the big winners from the globalization uh, angle, but I think in a deglobalization trade war scenario, those same populations are going to be the losers. I find this wraparound politics of, of uh, extraordinary, right? And uh, you know, I mean, if you might. I, People aren't really saying it, but just imagine, you know, global growth. The trade wars have probably cut half a percentage points off global growth, you know, 1% off global growth. You know, one person, just imagine this, one person, Trump, is responsible for shaving half a percentage points off global growth. Just think about that. I mean, uh, global GDP is, I don't know what it is, let's say 50 trillion, 40, 50 trillion. One person, one person's kind of ego essentially, or his, his legal problems, or whatever you want to call it. I mean, isn't that extraordinary that this person is making the world poorer, you know, and it's making the poorest in the world poorer. Mm. Uh, I, it's extraordinary. I mean, you know, I, I, you know I, I, look, there are many problems with globalization, right? And I think, uh, in, you know, we've not thought enough about inclusive growth. Uh, we need to think more about inclusive growth, but less globalization is not going to help the problems of the poorest people in northern England, right? It's going to make them poorer, for sure. It's going to make the people in Pennsylvania, in the Midwest, poorer, for sure. No doubt about that. Um, so, I mean, the, the, the challenge is not globalization. The challenge should be thinking about inclusive growth. Just bringing that back to Turkey, interestingly, I think the secret of AKP and Erdogan's success in that first... Uh, golden period of AKP rule for 2002-2011 was inclusive growth. Why was Erdogan so popular? It delivered jobs, housing, education, healthcare to the section of the Turkish population that never got it. I mean, he, Erdogan invented inclusive growth. I would argue that his 
uh, his, his political problems in recent years, there's been a movement away from that inclusive growth. And interestingly, in Turkey, if you look at, popul uh, if you look at data on uh, you know, living standards of different sections of the community, I mean, there was, a, there was the first decade of AKP rule, uh, the poorest did really well. In the last five years, there's been uh, a reversal of that, interestingly. Okay, thank you very much, Tim. Uh, I have a last question. Uh, let's move to future a bit. Uh, because our second subject is uh, future of investment management, future of investments. Uh, there are some headwinds in the front of uh, investment industry, such as uh, there, there are new regulations, such as MIFID. We talked about that. We talked about uh, that there, uh, Mark as well. And also uh, emergence of computers, uh, machine trading, computer trading, AIs, and everything. So how do you think investment and fund management will, evo will evolve uh, in the near future? Yeah, I think I need to retire <laughs> quite soon. In fact, I, I'm thinking about that uh, almost as we speak. <laughs> uh, I mean, I don't know. I can't really talk about, uh, you know, what I know about is research. That's what I do uh, or have done in the past. And, uh, you know, in terms of MIFID II and... Uh, its impact on, on information, uh, it's been negative in my mind. Uh, there's, there's, o there's been over-regulation of my part of the business, which is research, that, and, and uh, you know, there's less information available. I mean, that, this idea of MIFID II was, we all hoped that uh, uh, portfolio managers, you know, we'd be basically, we'd, for we'd uh, be forced to buy research from big banks, we'd pay money, maybe we wouldn't pay money, we'd pay money to third-party research providers, and there'd be a, a boom in, in third-party research providers, that whole industry has expand. Actually, we're now paying for something that we didn't pay for before, we have less money to pay for third-party research providers, the quality of bank research has declined, there's less good information available, and, and what's actually happened is, there's been a, basically buy-side firms have tooled up, they've they, they're doing all their own research now, which they don't publish. <laughs> so I don't think that's healthy. For me, you know, when I worked on the sell side in banks, salespeople always wanted to restrict what I gave out, what I distributed in terms of research just to clients. And I always ignored them. Basically, I always distributed what I wrote to everyone because for me, you know, it, it's, it's ideas. In the, in, the, in the age of the internet, everything is available anyway. If anyone wants to get anything I write or say, you can always find it. It's always out there. Why, why restrict it? And, and, it, and it's perverse. In, in, the, in the age of, you know, in the age of, you know, information technology and social media and all that stuff, perversely, and MIFID, MIFID II, in my mind, seems to be, the result is, be, is, is actually to restrict information, to get less information to fund managers, I think. Anyway, yeah, yeah. it's my personal uh, yeah, bug there. Okay, uh, Tim, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we, uh, we just have to uh, use our time efficiently and effectively. So I'll, I would like to turn to the audience and take a couple of questions before moving on to uh, our second speaker. Uh, is there any question for Tim? Maybe we can have a couple, one or two questions. Please. Müsaadenizle sorumu Türkçe soracağım. I've been coming here 20 years, right? And my Turkish is still terrible. <laughs> you know, my best word in Turkish is the, because, the word for I receipt. I can speak better Fish. than English, Turkish. Tabii e, bu harika konuşma için öncelikle teşekkür ederim. E, sanıyorum bizleri son derece aydınlatıcı e, ve e, zihnimizi de geliştirici bir konuşma oldu. Hello. 
challenges. Hmm. The world of technology, right? Uh, it's, uh, teknoloji her zaman önemli. Evet, önce teşekkür ediyorum. Çünkü e, son derece güzel, harika bir ko konuşma oldu cevaplarla birlikte. Number two, I think it's Hakan. Is it working? Okay. Thanks. Sorry, I issues. Problem. If not, it's fine. It's okay. That's okay. Yeah. That's okay, I think it's. Tekrar edeyim. Gerçekten harika bir konuşma oldu. Hepimizin ufkunu açan bir konuşma oldu. Ben iki konuda bir soru sormak istiyorum. Şimdi 2018 yılı en yüksek gelir vergisi verenler listesi açıklandı Türkiye'de. İlk kon içerisinde altı tane banka görülüyor. Ama dünyadaki uygulamalara baktığın zaman en fazla vergi verenler listesinde, mesela Almanya'da üretim yapan şirketler olduğunu görüyoruz. Ee, Türkiye'yi siz e, bir ortodoks bir e, faiz politikası uygulanması noktasında öneriyorsunuz, doğru. E, dünyanın dışında iş yapılamaz, yani belirli kurallar içinde. Ancak e, eğer Faizler de belirli bir noktaya çekilmezse üretim yapılamıyor. Sadece finans kesiminin kar ettiği bir sistem ortaya çıkıyor. Paranın parayla değiştirilmesi üretimi hiçbir zaman için arttırmıyor. Ve bu ülkedeki kırılganlığı da giderek arttırıyor. Dolayısıyla böyle bir düzenin devam etmesi Türkiye'nin hiçbir zaman için hayrını olmadığını da görüyoruz. Bu konuda ne söylemek istersiniz? Birinci sorum bu. İkinci sorum da ben Avrupa Birliği bakan yardımcısı olarak üç yıl görev yaptım. Batı ile olan ilişkilerin hep içinde oldum. Ee, acaba Türkiye Batı'dan mı uzaklaşıyor yoksa Batı kendisinden mi uzaklaştırıyor? Çünkü şöyle düşünün, siz dostluk yapmak istiyorsunuz ama ayağınızda bir yara var. Tam geliyor yanınıza, elinize sıkacağı zaman önce ayağınıza basıyor. Ayağınıza basınca siz zaten suratınızda her şeyiniz aynı anda değişiyor. Böyle bir ortamda siz e, iyi bir konuşma yapabilir misiniz? Türkiye'nin hassas olduğu noktalar var. Mesela bunlardan en önemli başında terörizm. E, ama terör örgütlerini destekleyen ülkeler belli. E, ayrıca gene <gülüyor> e, Türkiye'nin belli komşularıyla Akdeniz'de e, problemleri var. Bunlar hatta devlet olarak sayılmadığı halde siz o noktalarda farklı hareket ediyorsunuz ve ister istemez e, her seferinde dediğim gibi gel dost olalım diyorsunuz ama yarasına da basarak diyorsunuz. Böyle bir ortamda dostluk olabilir mi? Peki teşekkür, teşekkür, teşekkür ederiz. ederiz. So, easy questions. <laughs> uh, the second one, I'll answer first, it's easier. I don't, I don't disagree. I mean, I think I, I, I'll wait for you to get your headphones on. Um, I don't disagree with the second, your second point. And I think, as I said earlier, you know, fault was on both sides. You know, as I said, I, I would blame uh, uh, Sarkozy and Merkel back in 2010 for the privileged partnership. The messaging to Turkey was terrible. And I think Turkey began to move in a different direction around that time. I mean, it's interesting. I would argue that the, the pinnacle of AKP rule was 2002, 2011. It was almost a turning point, that, that Sarkozy, uh, uh, Merkel partnership. I would, however, say I find it absolutely incredible that Turkey is buying S-400s. I'm sorry, but, and, and you can argue you need it for your defense, you try to buy Patriots, but, uh, you, know, uh, you know, Russia, is undoubtedly the biggest challenge to NATO. To buy uh, offense, well, defensive, offensive weapons from uh, a NATO adversary 
sends an incredibly bad signal to the rest of NATO. Now, we have a huge debate about S-400s, et cetera, but, uh, and again, there are both, there's, there's faults on both sides with respect to S-400s and Patriots, uh, but I'd be amazed if sanctions don't come down the line for S-400s. But anyway, I, I kind of agree with you in many respects in terms of your second question. On the first, I totally disagree with you. Well, <laughs> no. Uh, low interest rates are required for investment. I totally agree, right? Uh, but you will only get low interest rates if you get low inflation. And, uh, you know, if you go back to the lowest in interest rates and the lowest inflation in Turkey was in 2011 under governorship of, of Dormoz Yilmaz, orthodox policy delivered both low inflation and low interest rates. Uh, and I think, why was there a crisis last year? You know, you can, you can blame foreign speculators, whatever you want to blame. The reality is there was massive uh, monetary policy errors made in 27 and 2018. The market, guys like me, were telling you the economy was overheating. You can't run, you can't finance uh, a 50 billion current account deficit with the level of interest rates you had, right? The central bank didn't react in time. That's the reality, right? If it had hiked rates 300 basis points six months earlier, you'd have probably got away with it, right? And you wouldn't be living with 25% interest rates you had last year. I'm sorry, it was absolutely 100% policy error. That's the reality. And, you're li and now you're living with the consequences of the policy error, right? It's basic 101 economics. I'm, I'm sorry. I have to tell you because that's the fact, right? I, there's no doubt in my mind that it was policy error. Now, okay, subsequently, you've raised interest rates, you begin to do the right kind of thing, but, you know, it's, it's a shame that central bankers or policymakers didn't listen to the market and economists and did what they did, should have done earlier. But, I mean, I don't disagree, right? I mean, low interest rates are required for investment, but how do you get to low interest rates? You have to fight inflation first. You need to fight inflation by keeping real interest rates at a sufficiently high level that investors have the confidence to invest. Okay, Tim, thank you very much. So you can ask questions after, afterwards, please. Uh, Tim, again, thank you for coming and joining us. And uh, it's been uh, very enlightening. Uh, we, got, uh, we appreciate for your views uh, for Turkey. You uh, participated with us. Thank you for coming again. So hope to see you again. Thank you to our distinguished guest, Mr. Ash. May I kindly invite board member of International Corporation Platform, Alaaddin Bükkaya, to present a plaque of honor to Tim Ash. Team Ash, uh, could we have you on the stage again, please? Our second guest is uh, our second speaker is Dr. Mark Mobius. Uh, Dr. Mark Mobius, please, stage is yours. Uh, Dr. Mobius, welcome again uh, for coming and joining us today Thank in this panel, uh, Turkey. Uh, again, you are well known. Worldwide, well known. You are well known in Turkey, definitely. Uh, I know you for about 25 years, actually. Uh, so I will start with your biography, but uh, it's a long one. I will try to make it short a bit. Uh, I know people know you, but anyway, I'll, uh, I, I have to read uh, some of your some of your uh, important points in your biography. Uh, uh, Dr. Morbius, as you know, uh, has been as uh, accepted as founder of the emerging market asset class. He has a reputation as one of the most successful and influential managers over the last 30 years. In uh, May 2018, with two, two colleagues, uh, Carlos uh, Hardenberg, uh, uh, he launched the Mobius Capital Partners. The firm utilizes, utilizes a highly specialized active investment approach with an emphasis on improving governance, stand, governance standards in emerging and frontier market companies. Uh, priority uh, Mobius uh, Capital uh, Partners. He was employed by Franklin Templeton, 
as, as you know, uh, for more than 30 years. Uh, most recently, as an ex executive chairman of Templeton Emerging Markets Group, during his tenure, he, the group expanded asset under management from 100 million to over 40,000 billion US dollars. And, uh, and he launched a, a number of emerging market funds, uh, focusing on Asia, Latin America, Africa, Eastern Europe, uh, and his career and uh, uh, includes as earned numerous industry awards. Uh, Dr. Marvius received his PhD at MIT and uh, studied at uh, Boston University, University of Wisconsin, Syracuse University, Kyoto University, and University of New Mexico. Dr. Marbus is a member of Economic Advisory Board of the International Finance Corporation, IFC. Since 2010, he has also served as a member of the Supervisory Board of OMV Petrom in Romania and previous director on the board of Lukoil, the Russian oil company. As a pro prolific writer, Dr. Marbus is the author of a number of books. His uh, latest book is uh, Invest for Good. We will be talking about that later. And uh, he's got he received many awards. If you, I will mention, Lifetime Achievement Award in Asset Management, 50 Most Influential People in 2011, Africa Invest Investor Index Series Awards, Top 100 Most po Powerful and influ Influential People, Emerging Markets Equity Manager of the Year 2001, 10 Top Money Managers of the 20th Century, Number One Global Emerging Market Fund, First in Business Money Manager of the Year 1994, Close Down Fund Manager, Investment Trust Manager of the Year, and many close down. So uh, congratulations, you got a uh, great career. Can I hire career. you as my PR consultant? <laughs> <laughs> <laughs> so in Thank short, you very much. <laughs> he's, as we know, he's the guru of fund management and emerging market and front, uh, frontier markets inv investments. As I said, I know him for uh, uh, 25 years. I know. 25 years ago, he's been traveling around the globe a lot, and every day he was on plane. He, he, he wasn't, we weren't able to even catch him. Uh, we would, uh, had only chance to catch him on the air somewhere. <laughs> but today, I've seen that it is still the same. He's still traveling. <laughs> he came from Washington, D.C., I think uh, to Istanbul. I think he's going to go to Dubai, yeah. then Mumbai, Dubai. then Singapore. Yeah. He's still traveling, <laughs> and it is amazing. And he's getting younger. <laughs> really, <laughs> so uh, so I, I admire you, Thank you. Uh, Mark. Really, uh, with all this work and energy, <laughs> and you always fit. So my first question: uh, What's the secret? What's, what's your secret? Trick? I think the, uh, the probably the secret, if there is a secret, is to uh, uh, be forever curious. In other words, uh, be willing to open up your mind and learn new things and be curious. Yeah. So curiosity is really driving me all the time because I want to go to a different place to learn what's happening, what's changing. For example, here in Turkey, the incredible changes. Uh, you know, a lot of people don't realize how much things have changed. When we started investing here in the early 90s, uh, the Istanbul Stock Exchange was in the old part, old city, and it was one table dining room table with a gentleman behind and an audience like this and he'd say okay uh, for this stock who wants to bid and that was it one yeah. day of mm -hmm. trading it took place uh, maybe three hours a day now of course you have this incredible uh, system with computerization and all the rest of it so I think one of the things that we've got to remember is the incredible progress that has been made around the world not only in Turkey but in other parts of the world and that's really exciting for me because when I go from one country to another, I notice these changes, it's just incredible. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay, uh, so again, you're one of the biggest experts in Turkey and Turkish markets uh, and everything. Uh, I will start with the same question uh, with Tim actually. Uh, how do you see investment climate uh, in Turkey nowadays? And the key question, your expertise, in terms of fundamentals, uh, do you think Turkish stocks are uh, cheap today or at their, their, their fair value, around their fair uh, value? First of all, I must say that Tim program. is a much better expert than I am, so you've got to listen to what he says. He's the, really the expert. He knows more than I do. Um, and uh, as regards to the question of whether Turkey is cheap or expensive, I would say um, in the 
in the comparison around the world, Turkey is relatively cheap. And the reason for that, of course, is that we've had an incredible correction in the currency. So if you're investing in US dollars or Euro, you can get some good bargains. And the market has also come down a lot. Um, but you must remember that we are all faced with a very, very critical situation with interest rates around the world. Because you're moving, as you know, into Europe in the negative rates. Donald Trump wants to have negative rates. Yeah. And, uh, that was going to be my you, question anyway. Yeah, and how do you value stocks? So, for example, if interest rates are 1%, the reciprocal of 1 is 100. 100 times price earnings ratio you can justify. So you're having a very strange situation globally. Of course, with the exception, Turkey is one exception because interest rates are much, much higher than that, but they're coming down precipitously. They're using a a fast decline of interest rates here. But uh, the big challenge we have globally now is how do you value a stock that we were able to buy at 10 times or five times in the past, and now it's 20 times. The average for stocks are now 20, 30, 40 times. So uh, uh, in that context, I would say that Turkey is cheap relative to other countries. Okay. Good, thank you very much. Uh, since uh, you've been investing in Turkey for the last 30 years, and you are also investing in other emerging markets, a c country similar to Turkey, Turkey's case, actually. Uh, in this context, uh, how do you see uh, Turkey's, what do you see Turkey's strengths and weaknesses? And uh, what would take, uh, what should be done for Turkey to be, get more developed, uh, move uh, from emerging market Arena to develop market arena in terms of macro policies and everything? Uh. Well, first of all, uh, you must remember that Turkey is full of very capable, clever businessmen, business people who have had global experience and are really very, very good managers. Um, you can see, for example, the development of Turkish Airlines. And uh, you must ask yourself what drove uh, the development of Turkish Airlines. And what it was, was the willingness of the government to privatize the company, bring in independent directors, uh, bring in outside help. For example, Doe & Co. Uh, we introduced Doe & Co. to catering, mm -hmm. to do the catering for Turkish Airlines. And that kind of development is what uh, is really good for Turkey. The freeing up of a lot of these uh, companies so that they can develop globally. Because uh, Turkish businessmen are very capable of working in any place of the world. And that's really a big strength. Yeah. Okay, so you share the idea that uh, Turkey has uh, good corporations, corporate board is uh, uh, kind of strength of Turkey, right? Uh, although we have some mi micro weaknesses. Yeah, and also I might add that uh, uh, there is a need for an improvement in corporate governance. Yeah. Uh, for example, uh, the companies here have the dual share class where um, one class of shares can appoint 50% of the board. I think uh, it would be good to eliminate that differentiation mm -hmm. because then it would be uh, the, you could have the ability to put more independent directors on the board of, of companies. But that's one thing that uh, doesn't have to happen immediately, but it could help corporate governance. Yeah, definitely. I think we are moving in that, in that target in that way, but uh, we still have a long, long way to go in, yeah. in Turkey, I think, in terms of corporate governance. And by the way, Turkey is not alone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because look at the US. You know, it's very interesting to see that Alibaba, the big Chinese firm, had two share classes. You know, the, the founders wanted to control the company. They wanted to enlist in Hong Kong, Hong Kong Stock Exchange, but at that time, the Hong Kong Stock Exchange did not allow two share classes. Hmm. So Alibaba went to New York, hmm. yeah. which is it's a very bad corporate governance in New York. Then Hong Kong changed because they didn't want to lose the IPOs <laughs> to uh, New York. Now they have two share classes allowed. Okay. So uh, it's really a problem good, globally. Good example. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah, thank you. Uh, you mentioned about the negative interest rates, and uh, we talked about it, Tim, as well, uh, negative interest rate policy that wanted, uh, President Trump wanted to follow. 
And uh, besides, uh, he is he's running a trade war with China. Uh, you very well know, well know that uh, part of the world, China, Southeast Asia. Uh, first, uh, you mentioned that, but negative interest rate policy, does that uh, really worry you? And uh, what do you think about the trade uh, wars? Uh, how is it going to impact Chinese economy and the region and the whole world economy in, if well, there first, would be I any think, agreement reached? Yeah, I think the first thing you've got to realize, and I think uh, business people in Turkey have got to think about, and that is uh, today Asia, the Asia capital markets are larger than the developed capital markets, US, London, and so forth. The number of companies listed, the size is larger. So uh, the movement of capital is moving more and more to Asia. And therefore, I think Turkey has got to think in that direction, uh, looking east instead of west. <laughs> That's number one. Yeah. Number two, uh, as regards to the China, US, so-called trade war, uh, it's not going to be over quickly. It's a long-term development of a conflict between uh, a hegemon, the U.S. has been a hegemon throughout the world, and they're being threatened by another hegemon, China. Yeah. And this kind of situation uh, is always open for some sort of cold war, let's put it that way. Not necessarily a hot war, but a cold war. Um, but people and business people in Turkey and in other parts of the world has, have got to look at this and think, okay, yes, it's affecting global trade, but how can we take advantage of this situation? And one way to do that is begin to replace Chinese manufacturers in their exports to the U.S. So in other words, uh, if you opened an export processing zone in Turkey and invited Chinese manufacturers to come here. You have a trade agreement with the EU and with the US. You are able to manufacture here instead of in China. The problem and the, and the uh, challenge that Turkey and other countries have is they don't have the scale of Chinese manufacturers. Right. So that means you've got to scale up in various areas. And that's why I mentioned export processing zones is one answer to that because it enables manufacturers to move in, import parts, assemble, manufacture, and then export without duties. So uh, it's a great opportunity and you see already this movement uh, around the world. For example, I recently met in Hong Kong one of the largest, if not the largest, manufacturers of baseball caps in the world. It's run by a Chinese woman in China, and she's moved most of her production to Bangladesh. And she's very happy because now she can get lower cost because Chinese workers' salaries are going up, but she can also export to the US and to other parts of the world. So this is the kind of development that we're seeing. So the China trade war should not be seen as a big uh, disaster, but an opportunity for Turkey and other countries. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mark. Uh, actually, uh, let's move on to future a bit again uh, in terms of uh, investment management future. Uh, in the past, I used to trade uh, with you, actually, uh, when I was uh, working at uh, Kinjar Securities, when I, ca I came from the United States, uh, we executed Mark's orders in, in the market. By that time, we, we used to get orders, uh, market orders through fax machines. <laughs> yeah. So, and we make the execution and write it down on a, on a piece of paper and send it to, back to by, by fax machines. And now it, things are changing, obviously. Exactly. And uh, then emails came. After emails, uh, Bloomberg terminals in introduced, and we, we used to get uh, foreign investment uh, orders, uh, tickets, through all those uh, different uh, different sources, uh, emails and uh, Bloomberg's. Now there's uh, another trend, as I asked to Ma uh, Tim. Now there's uh, uh, computers, yeah. Uh, yeah. algorithms, AIs. Uh, what do you think about that? Do you think you, you, you've been a great fund manager? Do you think uh, machines will uh, take over the role of asset managers in the future? 
in near future or we will still need humans to run funds and also the maybe you can answer in yeah. terms of active and passive management that's an issue also in the investment world but also the role of computers uh, in, in future what do you think well I agree with Tim that there's been excessive uh, regulation um, the I think the MIFID uh, regulations have been a disaster because uh, the reality is that whereas in the past uh, there was a lot more research being done available to a lot more people, particularly smaller investors. And today, with this system of separating uh, research from the brokerage, you don't have that. You don't have, now you have to pay, of course, for research, and that means it limits uh, the smaller investor to their access to this research. So I think MIFID has been a really big disaster. And I think, generally speaking, the regulations uh, in Europe and the U.S. have been excessive and there has to be a cut in these regulations at the end of the day. But, I think Trump uh, is trying to turn that around, I think, right? Yeah, hopefully that, that will change. Um, change. But then on the other side, what's happened as a result of computerization and the spread of information, faster spread of information, um, people have begun to ask, what is the cost of investing? In other words, what am I paying my investment manager? What am I paying my custodian? What am I paying my back office? And people have begun to demand uh, lower and lower fees. Now, this has been exacerbated by the decline in interest rates. Because, for example, if you're uh, getting 1% on your bonds, and the management fee is 1%. Yeah. People begin to say, hey, wait a minute, what's going on here? Right. Doesn't make sense. So that's another problem. Yeah. So what we've seen in the uh, investment management business is a, a rise of uh, ETFs, exchange traded funds, and passively managed funds, which are uh, pioneered by John Bogle, you know, the, the, the guy who really went into index funds. Mm -hmm. And his argument always was, hey, active managers can never outperform, so why not go into a passive fund and not pay uh, a crazy cheaper, management fee? Cheaper, so what's happened is that there's been an incredible growth of ETFs, exchange-traded funds, so that, in fact, just this year, the amount of exchange-traded funds coming into the market have been greater than the amount going into active funds. So active managers, like us, now have to say, wait a minute, we've got to do something that's really different because the clients are not going to pay us 80 basis points or 70, or whatever. Uh, they're not going to pay us that fee unless we give them something that's completely different from an index fund. So we've had to move into new areas. And of course, as you know, we've moved into ESG uh, and particularly G, the governance area to give people that extra value that we can bring to the table as active managers. Mm -hmm. But that's a big, big challenge for the industry. Yeah, you have, you have to beat them actually, right? In order to make uh, well, it's, investors it's that, more it's that. Confident. It's interesting. It's very interesting uh, when you talk to clients, uh, they'll, it, you know, they won't ask you about performance first. Hmm. At least I'm talking about the family offices, institutional investors. They'll say, okay, what, what is different about you? You know, what can you tell me that's different? And I remember in New York, we were sitting, I don't know, with Tim, you've probably had this experience. We were sitting with a family office, and they said, what's the average number of stocks that you have in your portfolio? And I said, well, about 25, which is very low, you know, considering uh, the past when we had 80 and 90 stocks. I said, 25. They said, so many? They said, we have some managers who have five stocks in the portfolio. So in other words, what they're telling us is that they want focus and concentration. Yeah. Because they believe at the end of the day, that will not only outperform, but more importantly, that can bring to the table uh, better corporate governance because you'll be more active and engaged with these companies. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the whole industry is changing in that way. Okay, okay, thank you. So uh, what do you suggest to, uh, because you have great experience, I know there are some uh, young investors and professionals here, but uh, uh, 
Could you give some advice to them? What, what do you advise them to how to pursue in a career in a financial world? Uh, maybe uh, well, they can the first thing is, you know, experience. learn, learn, learn, read, read. Uh, learn as much as you can. Keep an open mind. Uh, be interested in a whole range of subjects. One of the great things about our business is that we can study almost anything uh, because it'll be relevant. So I can sit here in the conference and listen to uh, people in the oil business and it'll be relevant to what I'm talking about. Or I can listen to somebody talk about blockchain and it'll be relevant. So I think the first uh, advice I would give to people is keep a very open mind and try to learn as much as you can about every subject. That, that's very, very important. The second thing I would say is uh, uh, do what you like to do. In other words, pursue those interests that are most exciting for you rather than uh, following somebody's el somebody else's advice because you're probably not going to do very well if you don't like what you're doing. That's right. Okay, thank you much. And last thing, uh, let's talk about your book. Uh, I, I know that you have written a book, a new book. Uh, it's called Invest for Good. Uh, would you uh, tell us about your new book? Yeah, what the, was all about? the book for... Uh, for Invest for Good was uh, written with the idea in mind of uh, the importance of governance. You know, you have the E, environment, S, social, G, governance. And we thought in that book we would try to explain to people why the governance aspect was so important and how governance impacted the social and environmental aspects of a company. So in the book, what we've done is given a number of ex real life examples of what we went through in you know the 30 years we've been. In the past, been. I know the, you even had uh, some problems with Chukurova and uh, some family oh, yeah. in, the, in the past. <laughs> you know, it's, it's been a long time, but you know, uh, I, I remember yes, those exactly. <laughs> we have governance a problems. Of, a lot of experience, yeah. uh, not only here but everywhere in yeah, the world. I'm sure. I mean, this is one of the things people misunderstand. They think, oh, emerging markets are more risky. No, they're not necessarily more risky uh, because you find the same problems. Uh, in developed countries. Yeah. And it's got, it, the book says it's uh, subtitles, healthier world and uh, wealthier youth. Exactly. Right? Because <laughs> what we found and what other researchers have found is that if you improve your governance, then the stock price of it does better. In other words, performance of the companies improve with better governance. Okay. Uh, Mark, thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to spare some time for Q&A. Uh, while you are here, uh, I'd like to ask the audience if they have any questions. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, let's turn to you. I think uh, there aren't many questions. I have many questions, but okay. you know, I, I wanted to. Let's go. Yes. Ee, tabii e, parayı en iyi bilen iki kişiyi dinliyoruz şu anda e, ve e, paradan nasıl para kazanılacağını da en iyi biliyorlar. Şimdi biraz önceki e, konuşmacıya sorduğum soruyu e, müsaadenizle size de sormak istiyorum. Şimdi tabii e, parayı para şeklinde döndürdükçe bir değer çıkıyor. Para kazananlar oluyor. Ama <gülüyor> Türkiye'deki e, olaya baktığım zaman e, gerçekten e, dikkat çekici bir tablo var. Sadece 2018 değil ama geriye dönük de baktığın zaman en fazla vergi veren şirketler arasında hep bankaların birinci sırada olduğunu görüyoruz. Ve mesela 2018'de 6 tane banka, ilk 10, banka, 10 sıranın içinde 6 banka var. Üretim şirketleri yok. Tabii bu Türkiye'deki finans sektörünün başka bir yanlışını da gösteriyor. Burada e, ister istemez e, faiz meselesi, e, eğer banka çünkü ne yapıyor? Birisinin parasını alıyor, biraz faiz veriyor, ondan sonra daha yüksekte satıyor. Yaptığı başka bir şey yok. Ee, sonuç bu. Ee, ama bankaların bu kadar fazla kazanması, tabii üretimi de ters yönde etkiliyor. 
Dolayısıyla e, tabii diğer konuşmacımız e, benim fikrime katılmadığını söyledi. E, saygıyla karşılıyorum. Ama siz ne düşünüyorsunuz onu merak ediyorum. Teşekkür ederim. You know, this reminds me of a, a very interesting story uh, back in the history in the 30s in America. John Dillinger was a big bank robber. He robbed a lot of banks. And someone asked him, John, why do you rob banks? He said, that's where the money is. <laughs> so, so uh, I think you, the, this situation you mentioned now uh, will probably not last because as interest rates in Turkey fall, uh, the margins, the bank margins will probably get thinner. It'll be more and more difficult for them. And of course, as interest rates fall, the industrial companies, the commercial companies will do better. They will have the ability to raise finance at a lower cost. So I think uh, it's probably a, a temporary situation. The other thing I think we've got to remember is that with the spread of the internet and with fintech, uh, the speed and cost of handling, transferring money, lending, and so forth will be coming down. It's happening all over the world now. Uh, I know you have sessions here about blockchain, which are very related to speed of transfers and so forth. So it'll be more and more difficult for the banks uh, to maintain these very, very high fees. They're going to have to come down. Of course, the volumes will increase, but uh, uh, I think you're going to see a change. Okay, thank you very much. Let me ask you the last question. Now, I know you face this question a lot, and uh, about the behavior of all uh, global view. What's your favorite emerging market and frontier, frontier markets these days? Which ones? I really don't have any favorite, frankly. Uh, uh, I like all these markets because there's always one or two companies that will be quite interesting. But I would say Turkey is at the top of the, one of the top in the list, uh, including India. India is very, very interesting yeah. for us at this stage of the game. Brazil, of course, China being so large, there are many companies that we can look at there. And then Indonesia is another place of interest. So uh, there are many, many countries now. I mean, must, as Tim mentioned, we've got 70 countries in which we can invest. Yeah. It's just an incredible opportunity around the world. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mark, uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, it's been our honor to host you here. Thank you for coming and joining us in this panel. Hope to see you in the new future in Turkey again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to our moderator and the panelists for the thought provoking discussion. Now I would like to invite the founder of international cooperation platform, Cengiz Özgencin, to present a plaque of honor to Dr. Mark Rokius and our moderator.